Hello and welcome to our live webcast, Customer-Centric Procurement, Correlating Customer Experience to the World-Class Performance. Thanks for joining us. My name is Kurt and I'll be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio settings using any computer or device volume settings that you have available on your equipment. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Q&A window. There is a large window which holds any of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you will type in your questions or comments for the presenter. To send in a question, click in the smaller text box and type in your text. When you've completed your message, click the Send button or simply press Enter. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presentation team, and your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's featured presenter, Richard Waugh, Vice President, Corporate Development for Zykus. Richard, welcome to the program. Well, thanks very much, Kurt, and thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, really pleased to, to join you for this discussion of the topic around customer-centric procurement. I'll explain in a moment sort of what that means and, and what it entails. A little bit about me. I'm Vice President, Corporate Development at Zykus. Amongst other duties, I do get involved in this type of a thought leadership program to sort of bring uh, to the market some of the, the best practices and, and innovations from a technology standpoint as well that are propelling the procurement profession forward. And, and that's certainly uh, one of my objectives for today. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Zykus just before we get into the agenda. Zykus, we are a technology provider of an integrated suite of source-to-pay tools. Um, that said, today today's agenda is customer-centric, not technology-centric, although I will be highlighting the ways in which technology is a critical enabler to achieve this customer-centric goal. And as we look across a source-to-pay suite of tools such as the, the Zyka suite here, certainly there are a number of functional applications that have come to be viewed as, as core components of a source-to-pay footprint from spend analytics, e-sourcing, contract and supplier management, procure-to-pay, and, and financial savings management. I'll also hi highlight some emerging applications that really advance this cause of customer centricity. So actually, in, in this graphic depiction, if you look at sort of the bullseye of this this dartboard, uh, tools for one view, a tool for an integrated dashboard visibility across source-to-pay processes. Uh, I manage for project management and tracking, and, and one that I'll highlight in particular today, which is a pretty recent phenomenon and innovation in the space, request management. We call it iRequest. But how do I create that front door, that portal through which all of my end-user stakeholders can engage the procurement function and have full visibility and transparency to the status and disposition of their request. So we'll be focusing on that as we go through today's discussion. And just to give you some of our credentials, Zykus is certainly recognized as a leader in the industry, uh, whether we're looking at the Gartner Magic Quadrant for sweet vendors on the left-hand side, the most recent uh, iteration being here in 2017 that has Zykus as a leader, or the Forrester Wave reports for both CLM and P2P. Uh, on the right-hand side, where Zykus is also uh, a leader in that wave. So what I wanted to cover then from an agenda standpoint, again, we're going to be talking today about customer centricity. And I think, you know, as we, we look at this area of endeavor at different times we may have heard it referred to as customer intimacy. Uh, another term that's gained a lot of traction lately, KYC, know your customer. I guess the problem for me is that when I say KYC, I think KFC, and then I get hungry for extra crispy or something like that. But today we'll, we'll use customer-centric as the preferred nomenclature, and we'll talk about what are some of the best practices. Uh, and I'll use uh, a lot of scholarship that for instance, the Hackett Group's put out, they give us some relevant benchmarks because it's not enough just to be customer-centric, but we want to correlate how does customer centricity uh, correspond or correlate to, in fact, achieving world-class or best-in-class performance. And some of the key trends here are driving towards a, 
what we'll call an, an omni-channel experience and, and personalization. I'll define what those things mean as we go through, and we'll talk a little bit about what I referred to earlier, this emerging space in the, in the procurement domain, request management, which is, act, after all, the initiation point, having a, an easy-to-use, transparent, visible process to allow your end user customers, those stakeholders in the business, to efficiently engage the procurement function. And after all, for so long we've been talking about how does procurement get that seat at the table, number one, get engaged on a greater proportion of the spend, and really critically earlier in the process. And this is a way that the technology is really enabling that. And I'll try to give us some some specific proof points through some case studies, including a case study here on Porsche, Porsche Cars North America. That is the correct pronunciation, by the way. The Americans tend to tend to make it Porsche, but Porsche would be the correct pronunciation, and we'll 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 go through that very quickly. Uh, and Porsche cars uh, are known to move quickly as well. Uh, but then we'll talk about the other component of the procurement suite, if you will, that that is the most visible for end users, which is P2P. That would be one of the areas where your internal customers would most often, in fact, not only internal customers, but external customers being the supply base, would interact with you most frequently on an ongoing and day-to-day basis through your procure-to-pay solution. So we'll talk about what matters to each of those classes of customers, whether they're internal stakeholders or external suppliers. And then finally, we'll look at the fact that being customer-centric, while a valuable objective, doesn't necessarily mean that all customers are created equally and you know, really share some best practices for how organizations are matching the service delivery model, in some cases very high-touch, kind of a white glove concierge level service for certain customers and certain categories of spend versus more of a self-service DIY or do-it-yourself approach for other customers that may entail, you know, lower dollar value or tail spend types of categories. And of course, along the way, happy to address any and all questions that may arise as we go through this this discussion of this customer-centric procurement model. So first I wanted to start, this is the Hackett Group's benchmark data that really looks at efficiency and digitization as a critical enabler of efficiency and comparing world-class performance to the peer group overall. And I think what's so revealing here is that world-class organizations, of course, have already gotten to a certain pinnacle of efficiency, if you if you will, that's what has landed them in the world class. Typically, the top 15 to 20 percent of organizations across industries and on a global basis. Now, what the world class organizations have seen, though, is as they've gone through an automated functional processes, and certainly they have lots of best of breed or best in class tools for the 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 functional source to pay processes, they've they've reached a point of diminishing returns where they've seen their their cost advantage from a procurement process cost sort of plateau. And what's so exciting here is, is what, uh, what Hackett is talking about is a next wave of productivity gains to be, to be realized through the, the next level of digitization, things like customer-centric uh, approaches, request management, and the like, that can could gain an incremental 35% productivity improvement even for the world class. And if you're not world class, there's still lots of opportunity because a digital transformation could shave your procurement process costs by about 25% and really close the gap between the average performer and the world class. A level. So there's a next wave of digitization coming in procurement, and it promises a next level kind of a breakthrough uh, productivity or efficiency gain to be realized. So 
one of the things we look at from a, a customer centricity standpoint then is tools, of course, are not enough. Uh, organization matters too. And here it's, it's really revealing to look at when we contrast world class to the peer group overall, world class performers are much more likely to have put in place defined service level agreements for their internal customers. So what does that mean? It means things like response time, uh, availability of reporting and analytics, certainly savings, a traditional procurement measure, but importantly, those service level agreements should be aligned to the stakeholders' metrics and measurements, which aren't always necessarily around cost savings. It may be more about uh, available to promise or fill, fill rates and those kinds of things. So it's really a key step that world-class performers have taken to really formalize those service level agreements to set expectations with those internal customers uh, where they're 56% of the world-class are doing that as compared to just 34% of the peer group, so a 65% higher rate. Um, beyond that, too, uh, more of those organizations have either developed as specific customer management organization or customer management roles within the procurement group. So that's actually 20% of organizations that have that kind of customer management role defined versus just sort of relying on the strategic sourcing project engagement process to get stakeholders aligned around a specific uh, category or sourcing project. So let's move on to uh, what it means to create an omni-channel and personalized stakeholder experience. So some pretty big words there. An omni-channel here, as, as the Hackett model has described, really means being able to engage the customer anytime, any place, 24-7 through a variety of means, whether that's through a traditional kind of a, a web application or desktop or or a voice or, or mobile application through social media. Uh, regardless of, of the channel, it means omni-channel, really, really any channel, to invite that stakeholder in to bring procurement into the process, again, hopefully earlier, where procurement can add the most value. And here we're talking, again, about two different types of customers, both the internal customer as well as the external customer being the suppliers. So we start with omni-channel as one of the key uh, sort of principles to be implemented here. Next, it's personalized. So if we wanted to create ubiquitous access for all stakeholders, frankly, that would be a much easier task than what most of our organizations uh, are really faced with, which is we want to create transparency, we want to create self-service, but... This is within an enterprise environment, so we have to really ensure that our, our user-based, uh, permission-based model gives the kinds of visibility that particular users and particular roles within the organization should have. So not everyone should have access to all information all the time. So the systems have to be sophisticated enough and the user model sophisticated enough to, to really personalize that experience. So. One element of the personalization, of course, is user access and controls, but it also means that the system has built in the intelligence to know, based on my user profile, who I am, where I sit in the organization, what my role is, and therefore what tasks I should have access to, what reports or analytics, what applications, and, and the permission in terms of the content, what I should be able to see. Now, transparency is the other key principle here. So I should be able, in a, on a real-time basis, going in with self-service access, have status visibility to, to my requests, to my requisitions, to whatever I happen to engage with the, the procurement function on. I shouldn't have to pick up the phone or email uh, my contact in procurement. I may not even know who that is. But I should be able to get all that information with real-time feedback uh, on a self-service basis. And last but not least, I think the other guiding principle here is that this becomes a one-stop shop. So while the omni-channel experience means I have multiple access points, what I should have once I reach that portal is a single 
one-stop shop experience to get all of the information to which I have access to, and that's whether I'm a, an internal stakeholder or an external supplier. So with those goals in mind, creating that omni-channel personalized stakeholder experience, I think it's helpful to kind of look at what are different organizations doing to actually enhance customer centricity both with internal and external parties. So a lot of data here uh, in response to Hackett's question, which is how are you planning to enhance customer centricity with internal and external parties in the coming years? So looking at the top responses, you know, number one, improving the reporting to stakeholders, giving them feedback. Number two, simplifying the processes themselves. Uh, number three, automating the P2P process uh, to, to a significantly greater extent. And number four, introducing the notion of a supplier portal to more efficiently not only onboard suppliers, but enable them for the ongoing collaboration with you as their customer, uh, both in terms of transactional activity, but, but also uh, performance measurement and, and, and other kinds of innovation-oriented type of collaboration that you'd like to engage with your suppliers on. Now, as we go down to the, through the list, many of them sort of start to, to repeat on those themes. But I'll point out, you know, the, the ninth one down this list talks about establishing a self-service status checking capability. So that's 32% of respondents said they're doing that. And that really points to this emerging space that I refer to as request management. Uh, within within the procurement function, and um, you know, so a significant portion, cer certainly, it's it's uh, amongst the earlier adopters at this stage, and 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 does correlate very strongly to best in class and world class performers that are that are going beyond the the functional applications that support source to pay and building that bridge to their customers by but deploying this kind of a request management customer-centric platform. Now, more and more organizations are looking to do that. And I wanted to start to, to sort of get some, some guidance, some, some uh, you know, best practices or tricks and tips. And, and I, we can look to uh, the case of the world's largest software company, which is Microsoft, uh, that, that has actually gone down this path. And, and see how they went about it. And, you know, recognize the fact that uh, not every company, if you're not the world's largest software company, would have the ability to develop this application on your own. So more and more organizations will be looking for commercial off-the-shelf tools to do this. But Microsoft, in fact, developed their own. I want to share with you a little bit about their story. This is something they shared at the Hackett Group's Best Practices Conference earlier this spring. And it's a pretty compelling uh, story when you look at, number one, the size and scope, the, the sheer scale of a Microsoft, for example, uh, $21 billion in spend, indirect spend, so a very large base of spend, a large procurement team to support that type of spending activity, over 250 people, 30 of which are kind of in a corporate sourcing role and uh, a very large supply base, over 30,000 suppliers, although already fairly consolidated. So 90% of those, 90% of the spend is with the top 400 of their suppliers, and clearly they're producing results. If you look at the the savings rate, 14% average savings on on a very large base of spend. However. Microsoft found when they looked at their existing infrastructure and ecosystem is that it was overly complex and created an onerous environment for their end users that really also created an imperative towards simplification. So not every company is, is as massive as, as Microsoft, of course, but you look at kind of the situation that emerged was there were way too many ways to buy something, over 12 uh, unique buying channels with different brands, and so there's clearly was not a one-stop shop environment. In fact, a proliferation of tools. And, and if there's one truism in the space, and Microsoft, of course, is a, a software company, uh, 
comprised of lots of developers and lots of talent, but developers will develop. And, and in this case, uh, had actually created over 26 different tools with 3 million configuration combinations. But it wasn't all complexity tied to the tools. They had too many corporate policies. So 73 corporate policies, hundreds at you know down at the local or country level. So that certainly creates complexity. And they just found that they weren't as efficient as they needed to be and actually calculated what that cost them in terms of productivity. So just looking at the REC to PO process, they calculated 24 million hours just in wait time when a PO took on average three days to process. Uh, that really consumed productive labor that could obviously be much better allocated to more strategic pursuits than tying up time, not only with the procurement staff, but their stakeholders on routine transaction processing. So lots of challenges for them to overcome. I think they took a very measured and strategic approach that really looked across all of the dimensions that had to be addressed to create the kind of customer engagement and customer-centric model that they sought, starting with the idea that content is king. So make sure that when users come to, if you're going to create a portal for for end users, a procurement portal, that they can find what they're looking for, that it's organized properly, that it's accurate and up-to-date information. And when they need to complete a task and they need guidance from a policy standpoint, that they're not this this morass of contradicting and overlapping policies, but a simple, straightforward policy that they can follow, and that they have the kind of engaging user experience that will make them want to come back, of course, and that the tools themselves are not enough. The procurement needs to uh, really market this concept, tell the right story, drive consistent, clear messaging to end-user stakeholders, and at the end of the day, having this kind of transparency and visibility, rely on the data to tell the story and data we trust. Having a fact-based, data-driven approach with your end-user stakeholders is the best way to demonstrate procurement value and the service delivery that the service delivery model is working for them. So what Microsoft did, and again, I think they're in a unique position to be able to roll their own uh, being the world's largest software company, I actually developed an application called Procure Web as that single entry to procurement. And you can see a user that would come here, you know, either through a, a desktop uh, device or a mobile application, has a drop down. And, and I start with, I need to do something. I need to identify who my contact is in procurement, learn, learn more about how to go about buying or contracting or paying or booking a trip, whatever it happens to be, um, have that single portal interface to initiate uh, a request with the procurement team at, at Microsoft. And they certainly simplified the experience and, and look to continuously simplify and improve that experience by creating a standard view of a a PO form, for example, by having sort of 24-7 uh, interactive chat support or help desk support, and then looking for feedback from the stakeholders. In a Microsoft case, they made it as simple as saying, send us a smile or a frown to kind of let us know what we're, do we're doing. And in, in hearing uh, Microsoft tell their, their story with this case study, I thought it was also uh, an interesting factoid or tidbit, tidbit, if you will, as they were developing and prototyping this application, they, the, you know, their workforce, of course, includes a, a lot of developers, a lot of you know, sort of millennial uh, workforce, you know, folks who are, you know, used to a certain type of standard when it comes to a, a technology application, not easily pleased, and. Uh, the Microsoft procurement folks certainly considered it a victory when the, the feedback they got from the initial beta users, if you will, was essentially it, it didn't suck. It wasn't too annoying. So with that type of constituency in, in mind, getting that reaction is actually a, akin to two big thumbs up, I think, for, for your run-of-the-mill user. 
So again, that's the you know what Microsoft was able to do, but not many organizations would be in the position to do that. So more and more organizations are looking to a commercial off-the-shelf capability for request management and significantly also that it's integrated with their overall source-to-pay platform. So I want to introduce the concept here of request management. In our case, it's a tool called iRequest. But kind of talk about generically what these type of solutions are designed to do. And certainly, you have to have a, a, a way to engage the end user to start with. They have to be able to initiate a request. And in an enterprise environment, most of those requests need to be triaged in some way before procurement knows if they should act upon them or not. So there's an approval process that really should go on that is enabled through a, a work, an automated workflow in this model such that when those requests reach the, the inbox of the appropriate person within the procurement function, they know that they've already been prioritized and properly approved to justify procurement uh, working on that particular request. And there are numerous use cases involved here. So an end user could say, I need help creating a sourcing event, onboarding a supplier, creating a contract. I need pre-purchase approval before I initiate a requisition in, in P2P, for example. So you know, many organizations say, before I want to enable that end user to raise a requisition, create a PO, I want pre-authorization that, that the expenditure is appropriate. So, so this solution could handle that upstream of, of the procure-to-pay uh, requisitioning module, for example. But there's a whole host of other uh, needs that an end user may have. They may, may have a need to uh, initiate a, a supplier corrective action type of a performance improvement program, amendments to various agreements, or initiate a project just as, as examples. And then the other key aspect here is that that request management tool would be a front end to the downstream source-to-pay applications and feed the data, all, all the specifics about the request, along with the approvals, uh, to, the, to the appropriate uh, functional application that's going to carry out that request, be it sourcing, contract management, P2P, supplier management as examples. And some of the key features to look for in this type of application, of course, we're dealing with multiple different types of requests. So it, it's a forms-based model that the user can create a form from a variety of templates, and those forms have to be flexible and configurable. Uh, likewise, a configurable approval workflow. After all, those approvals are going to be different depending on the type of request, the type of expenditure, be it OPEX or CAPEX, or the dollar threshold involved. And there may be some conditional logic or rules that would be required. So certain types of requests are going to initiate different types of activities. So, for instance, if I want to onboard a supplier, let's say, in, in the IT space for hardware or software, that may initiate a secure, an IT security review process and a different set of parameters and a different set of approvers as well. And, of course, Part of the approval process is, is really looking at what are the budget implications. So there are calculated fields in, in these flexible forms. I, there may be multiple different levels of approvers and, and different uh, approvers across the organization of being able to delegate that approval and, of course, end-to-end -end comprehensive reporting with one of, one of the most critical capabilities being that an end user has self-service status visibility. So that's really one of the keys to uh, customer satisfaction is when that they initiate a request to engage procurement, it doesn't go into a black hole. They know exactly what's being done, and they can track uh, the disposition of that request all the way through to resolution or fulfillment. So a lot of different use cases just in the procurement domain but the other interesting development in this application space is that this request management platform can also be used in a more generic fashion in a variety of things that we might consider outside of the traditional procurement domain, non-procurement 
request management use cases. So in IT, uh, there are a number of those that that involve sort of uh, engaging help desk support or support on a software installation or upgrade or provisioning VPN access. If it's in the facility space, it may be relocating an employee uh, to, to a different office location or booking hotels, fixing connections, uh, really any functional group, marketing, sales, HR, finance, if it's budget re- approval or getting access to financial reports on a permission basis or in travel and expense to, to request travel, any of these could be could utilize this type of request management solution to simplify and streamline the approach. So I wanted to share another case study, again, Porsche, uh, a Zykus customer, and, and what they've gone through in their journey. Uh, in fact, this is Porsche Cars North America, and we all know Porsche is a you know, leading German manufacturer of high-performance sports cars, SUVs, and sedans. And the, the, the PCNA, Porsche Cars North America, is the exclusive U.S. importer of Porsche vehicles. And they've created actually a, a shared service procurement center that supports not only PCNA, but 11 other North American affiliates, including Porsche Canada, Latin America, and financial services. So that's that's the uh, the background on the customer. Let me tell you a little bit about what some of their key challenges were and what led them towards this path of you know, enabling an end-to-end process and, and really with this view towards customer centricity. Uh, some of the existing challenges that they faced, um, well, first of all, it kind of paints you a picture of the technology footprint. They They were not without any solutions. They had point solutions in place with a contract repository, but did, did not include authoring capability, a point solution for e-sourcing, but not integrated to the other aspects of sourcing and procurement and, and really not gaining the kind of adoption or traction that they were looking for. When it came to the area of request management, for instance, that was dealt with the same way most of your organizations do typically, email and phone calls, you know, which lack the kind of visibility and status tracking and and just robustness and discipline or rigor in the process that most are looking for. Uh, Likewise, in the project management space, pretty typical. Microsoft Project uh, being a very capable tool, we just talked about the Microsoft case study, uh, for managing discrete projects, what it didn't give them is enterprise executive level visibility to the pipeline of projects across the procurement organization so that they can forecast and track savings generated from those projects. Uh, So that was a challenge. As regards supplier information management, again, similar to most organizations, limited in their capability as to what they could do with the existing uh, supplier master in ERP. And, uh, you know, oftentimes the the information that's captured there is really limited to what it takes to get a vendor invoice paid, but not nearly uh, the type of broad-based information around a supplier profile, certifications, quality standards, and capabilities that, uh, that Porsche, among others, was looking for. So, The way that that technology footprint and some of the gaps that they saw manifested itself in terms of some of the challenges, as I said, from a contract management standpoint, yes, they had created a repository, but they hadn't done anything to address, uh, you know, the contract authoring and contract creation process. They couldn't uh, enable templates and clause libraries and, and the redlining and versioning control, et cetera. And from an e-sourcing standpoint, they really didn't have stakeholder buy-in or effective means to collaborate with the stakeholders on the sourcing projects and sourcing events. And from a request management standpoint, they were tracking those requests manually, and they didn't really have a way to triage which ones they should be working on because they didn't have that approval workflow process to uh, you know, prioritize those requests 
for procurement participation. So overall, a lack of transparency. And as I mentioned, from a project management standpoint, not having that dashboard kind of visibility so that from a, from a key executive standpoint, they can forecast what projects are we working on, where do we expect the savings pipeline to matriculate from. And then uh, with a supplier information management, really having fragmented information, certain certain aspects of supplier information contained in the ERP supplier master, but you know a, pro, a proliferation of different pockets of information residing in different locations and not universally visible across the organization. So uh, Porsche really wanted to go from zero to 60 very fast. Fortunately, they have the right vehicles to do that. Uh, and really the overarching goals and vision here was how do we create that single version of the truth? So they really wanted an integrated suite of tools across source to pay, but not just the functional applications, but also that that front door, that portal for request management to be able to give cut their internal customers that kind of status visibility and transparency and feedback that really demonstrated the value that they were able to deliver to the organization. And in, in short order, been able to consolidate uh, over 1,200 agreements following a standardized process, conducted a number of sourcing events at one time over 80, but it continues to grow, uh, organized all the supplier content into uh, the supplier information management tool, over 1,700 suppliers in total, and uh, and also took on some pretty significant savings projects and created a pipeline of uh, over 45 specific savings projects yielding uh, a, a very significant savings as a percentage of the total spend, $15 million in savings against uh, about $45 million in, in spending. So uh, dramatic uh, solution benefits being realized here. And some of the other business impacts and, and you know, the Porsche principle uh, paraphrase is how do we translate performance into speed and success, which is true for the vehicles that they market, of course, but I think was also true in, in terms of the, the charter and objectives for the procurement uh, team and the shared services operation at Porsche. And here they've deployed a, a suite of tools, uh, the Zyka suite for contract management, sourcing, request management, project management, and supplier information management. And you know, first of all, the Porsche principle translated to the procurement operation was, was first and foremost, let's start with self-service. So as we deploy tools like contracts and sourcing and, and uh, supplier management, within the, the required user access controls and permissions, the first principle that Porsche put into place was let's enable self-service wherever possible. Because after all, that in and of itself is one of the best ways to reduce the load on the procurement staff. If end users, with, again, with the appropriate access permissions and controls, can find on their own the contract that they need to review or, or a scorecard on a supplier's performance or their profile of information, uh, that eliminates that burden on the procurement function altogether. Uh, so let's spend less time gathering data that end users may require and more time after they've had a chance to uh, review that data to, to take specific value-added actions. And that's where the request management tool came in for them. So if, if, a, if a user can't find what they need themselves on a self-service basis, now they need to engage procurement through the request management uh, tool. And in that case, uh, they've really seen, because of the ease of use, very high adoption and high vis visibility. So in addition to all the different requesters that may have a need to create a request, over 190 approvers involved in this process. And, and some of these requests uh, may entail four to five levels of approval. So having the sophistication in 
in the approval workflow process to manage this on a on a conditional basis. Uh, what, depending on the type of request, what does the approval process entail? What does that user need to, um, you know, provision in terms of the the specifics uh, based on the type of request that they're raising? So. At the end of the day, it really what it delivered for Porsche was increased transparency for all the different stakeholders, much greater efficiency for procurement because they're only working on those strategic value-added requests, uh, better adoption across the user base, both within procurement and within the end-user community, and, and certainly much better collaboration and visibility at the executive level as well. So, as I mentioned, the, the two key applications from a, from a customer centricity standpoint, in addition to this emerging you know, innovation around request management, more traditionally would be procure to pay. That that would be the application that your end users would more likely interface with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's for better or worse, likely going to inform their perception of procurement's value and their satisfaction with procurement. The challenge here, as shown in, in this Hackett data from a forum they conducted on purchase to pay, is that when they asked uh, you know, survey respondents if your organization was polled today, how would the majority of your end users rate your P2P process? The answers were were that they were less than satisfied, you know. So that just four percent, in fact, said that they were essentially completely satisfied. Uh, Twenty-five percent in total that said somewhat satisfied to to satisfied, but most are either neutral or or really dissatisfied. So so that's a scorecard that the. Uh, you know, most procurement organizations are going to have to look to, to flip that, you know, get get to the point where the vast majority are at least somewhat to, to fully satisfied. And, you know, part of the condition here is that uh, while many organizations have deployed P2P solutions, uh, many of those may not be sort of state-of-the-art or best of breed. They may be uh, what they had put in place with uh, as a legacy system or with the incumbent ERP, and uh, many organizations are, in fact, looking at refreshing P2P to really address this this challenge from a user satisfaction standpoint. So it's really borne out by the, the market growth, actually 13% growth rate in the market in 2017, according to Forrester's e-procurement wave report. So there's a P2P 2.0 renaissance going on, and can be attributed to, to a large extent to this type of a, a disconnect with end users where uh, P2P is going to have a major impact on the ability to establish that customer centricity and to drive user satisfaction with procurement. And many organizations are looking to refresh that capability uh, in P2P right now to drive these numbers up on the satisfaction scale. So what does it mean to be customer focused in P2P? What's the vision here? Well, first of all, it comes down to the, the way end users engage and interact with the experience. And really, we're talking about a guided buying experience here to simplify the process for end users, make it easier for them to search and find the product or service that they need to place their order and check out and, frankly, get on back to their day-to-day -day process because they're, they're not in the business of of buying, uh, they're not procurement professional users, so they want a simplified user experience to do that more efficiently. And yes, they want to be able to complete the shopping cart, check out quickly, but they don't want that to be the end of, uh, you know, their access. They they want full visibility to once I place that requisition. What types of, appro of an approval chain does it have to flow through? How do I get real-time visibility to where it is and actually be able to jump in if needed to, 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 uh, to address if a requisition is getting hung up somewhere along the line? Because after all, they may have a very critical need for that product or service to complete a project that they're working on. 
So they want visibility, transparency. They want self-service capability to do this independently. And they want to make sure that procurement is really cognizant of their goals uh, and their success metrics. So it's not just about traditional procurement metrics such as cost savings. It's what matters to that end user as well. So what matters to those end users are, are really a combination of three key areas to focus on, process, technology, and organization and governance. And, and these are the ones that mattered the most in, in Hackett's survey that, number one, you've, you've got a clear, well-defined process that's easy for me to understand what I need to do. Uh, there's an automated mated process, and I've got a compelling, kind of an intuitive user experience. And anywhere along the line that I experience challenges, I want to do as much as I can self-service, and I don't need to bother you unless I have a problem. But if I do have a problem, I want to know that I can get real-time feedback through a, through a chat support or help desk support, and, and that as I place requisitions and, and uh, you know, my suppliers are looking to get paid and may be calling me to find out about their invoice or payment status, I want to be able to go in on a self-service basis and be able to address those things as well. So that's what matters to uh, P2P customers. What does it look like to be a top performer in P2P? And again, Hackett's uh, provided us three different characteristics of top P2P performers, and it starts with this focus on internal stakeholders. And so we can talk about the qualitative aspects of the user experience, that it's intuitive, that's easy to use, all those kinds of things. But then at the end of the day, the desired result is that the process itself steers users to make compliant purchases, that uh, they buy from the approved contracted vendors at negotiated prices in the prescribed way, according to the the, the appropriate and optimal buy pay channel. And here again, we look at top performers versus everyone else. Top performers are much more likely, 85% of their purchases, they're able to ensure go through the you know, preferred buy pay channel versus just 61% for others. So the way the technology has manifested itself in, in, in the Zykus case anyway, the innovation here is, how do we leverage artificial intelligence to drive a guided buying process? So rather than rely on the user's natural, uh, which after all, they may not have any familiarity with the particular commodity or you know, which supplier is the approved contracted vendor, or certainly how to, how to categorize or code that transaction, the system ought to be smart enough, have the artificial intelligence built in to guide me to the appropriate supplier and auto assign the correct category and GL code so I don't have to think about all those details when I go to check out. The next characteristic is really this aspect of information digitization. And here, top performers are just about twice as likely or have two times, nearly two times as much of their spend transactions accurately categorized and coded at a granular level, meaning a, you know, an item level categorization that's going to help them get the insights to do a more effective job with strategic sourcing. Not only that, the top performers are much more likely to be able to drive spend compliant to their contracts. So whereas a top performer has compliant spend uh, better than two-thirds of the two-thirds of spend compliant to contract, 67 percent, less than half of spending for the average performer is compliant to contract. So that's 23% more of your total spending that's compliant to the contract. Now, one of the ways that the Zykus innovation from a technology standpoint helps enable that is through a solution we call contract lock. And the reason this is so important is that even those top performers in P2P only have about 25% of their spending on catalogs higher proportion, about 40% of the transactions. But that says three-quarters of my spending that goes through a P2P process is not on a catalog because it's for a service 
or it's for a non-standard kind of a, a product purchase that's not catalogable. And in that regard, it's really critical to have this tight integration between P2P and contracts such that in the first instance, you could actually create uh, sort of a, a rate card or service catalog by flipping the the the, the rate card information from the, the contract right into a catalog. Really critical that that catalog that, sorry, that contract information is available at the point of requisition to, to provide the, the pricing and terms information to complete a compliant requisition and a PO, that that PO actually references the contract to the supplier, and that on the off chance that you still have some non-PO invoices that show up, and I know nobody has that problem, uh, the link to the contract is going to fill those gaps. Where, where the PO doesn't exist, the contract will at least tell me what the purchase was for, who authorized it, how to code that invoice for payment appropriately. And the last characteristic that really distinguishes top P2P performers is the level to which they've digitized the transaction process. Uh, you know, almost one one and a half times or more than one and a half times, 1.6 times more of their PO transactions are touchless. And on the invoicing side, it's even a greater proportion. They're almost four, four times more, a greater percentage of their invoices are electronic invoices as compared to the uh, average performer overall. And here it's about how do you enable suppliers. And again, as I said, not all customers are created equal. The fact is not all suppliers are created equal either. And the best practice here is how do I get a critical mass, often the the 20% or fewer of my suppliers that are generating 80% of the transactions. That's how I take the friction out of the P2P process. So when we talk about P2P, as I said, suppliers are customers too. And the best practice here certainly involves deploying a self-service portal for suppliers to be able to check their invoice approval and payment status without having to pick up the phone and call someone in either AP or procurement or even the end user requester, a lot of lost productivity uh, involved in responding to those inquiries when a self-service capability could allow the suppliers to track that information themselves and do a better job of forecasting their own working capital needs by having that kind of visibility. And, you know, throughout, there's a lot that can be done with supplier management virtually. You know, a, a self-service registration process through the the SIM, the supplier information portal, allows them to do a lot of the, the work themselves to get onboarded in the first place to maintain and keep up-to-date documentation like cert certificates of insurance or W-9 forms and those kinds of things. And certainly it's a best practice to maximize the use of the automated tools to accomplish those goals. But, uh, you know, you see here 25% still say we want to establish business review forums and meetings. So that says that uh, while you use technology as much as possible, there's still no substitute for having that face-to-face -face rapport and interaction with suppliers through ongoing uh, feedback and, and meetings, et cetera. So what are some of the keys to in inquiry management? You know, managing inquiries involves this, this process of identifying opportunities, getting down to root cause, finding the, the possible solutions and monitoring the improvement. But at the end of the day, it's really about a, a quality process that's going to reduce the, the amount of defects or, or you know, that, that cause inquiries in the first place and then when, when and if they do occur, it's being able to uh, remediate those as much as possible through a self-service capability. So what do suppliers want to know? Typically, they're asking these kind of questions. Did you get my invoice? What's the status? When am I going to get paid? If I need to update my profile or banking information, how do I do that? And really, the, the model here is that single portal where a supplier can come to take care of all of those tasks. And the benefits that have been realized through the Hackett study here are dramatic in terms of building a business case for this capability. So 
Digitization has been shown to reduce the, the volume of paper invoices by 42%, cut the invoice processing cost by about a third, and spend about a quarter less time just simply responding to inquiries overall. Another best practice, this one's uh, again from Hackett's study of Mondelez International as regards P2P, certainly using uh, the supplier performance metrics and technologies, but also going through uh, a series of forums and meetings uh, with suppliers to have that face-to-face -face feedback and interaction as well. Here's a case study of uh, a customer in the banking and financial services industry that really looked at the supplier enablement challenge. And in adopting the best practice, which is let's focus on the 20% that generate 80% of the transactions, that meant really targeting 500 suppliers. And even within that supplier, you know, preferred or strategic supplier group, if you will, the 500 or 20% of the, the total, the 80-20 rule applies once again in that 20% of those suppliers would be enabled through uh, an e-commerce protocol. They're the larger tier one suppliers that are e-commerce savvy using uh, CXML or EDI as a standard, but 80% were enabled and engaged simply through a browser access to the portal where they can flip the PO into an invoice, do, do the self-service status checking, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the gains here, dramatic cycle time reduction uh, on the order of about a third across the board, 87% uh, reduction in the internal FTE support required in the vendor management area because, again, you're, at, you're really outsourcing more of that work, if you will, to the suppliers themselves because they can do it on a self-service basis. And it pays off in... in reducing the time spent in the end in the overall P2P cycle 40% just in the invoice processing cycle time alone. So the last piece I want to cover here is customer centricity of course doesn't mean all customers are created equal. Here's a model of sort of a a non-mature pro procurement organization that only has about 55% of total spend under management or influenced and most organizations, certainly world-class performers, would like to have a much higher percentage. But it still says there's always going to be a residual amount of tailspin that may not be appropriate for procurement to have to manage, but which you want to empower and enable end users to do on a self-service basis. And here the innovation is really uh, a tool uh, for self-service sourcing. So many organizations may say if it's less than 25000 in spend, procurement can't get involved because it's not enough for us to worry about, but the user still needs to get three competitive quotes. So here the technology evolution is how do I make it simple enough on a self-service basis for non-procurement users to create a, a simplified RFQ, a single screen to, to create an RFQ from a template. So I'm following a standard process. I'm making it compliant by getting three competitive quotes, the three bids and a buy for a tactical purchase. I compare those bids side by side, and I can make an automated award. And oh, by the way, I don't have to go through an extensive supplier onboarding process. I can simply onboard and invite a supplier on the fly with just an email address. So that's another way where customer centricity is putting the tools in the hands of end users and empowering them to do more themselves. So. A lot of ground covered on our journey towards customer centricity. I know I've taken uh, nearly all the time, uh, but promise to address any questions uh, subsequent to the session that we can't cover today. And let me just remind our audience, if you submit a question, all you have to do is send that through the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. As mentioned, we have just a couple minutes remaining, so if you do have questions, please send those in right away. Uh, first up, I do have one question. Um, and we'll start with this one. Can you tell me how to act, how to assess stakeholders to find out their satisfaction level? Yeah, so it's a great question, um, and certainly one of the one of the tools that's been used frequently is called the Net Promoter Score, which is a really a, a pretty simple survey tool that that basically uh, 
it's called the net promoter score, by the way. It could just as easily be a net detractor score if, if uh, the measurements were act- actually negative. But it sort of throws out anybody that's neutral and compares those that are strongly supportive promoters to detractors. And hopefully you've got a, a net promoter score. But uh, that's one that I've seen used very effectively as a simple survey tool. You know, you're rating on a scale of 1 to 10, and on the higher range, of course, are, are net promoters. Uh, but uh, the other trend that I've seen is using the scorecard tools that are included in, in most source-to-pay suites, certainly in the Zyka suite, uh, to do a scorecard on your own performance as, as a procurement function. Ask your survey uh, your stakeholders to rate your performance against those SLAs, those service level agreements, and produce a scorecard on yourself. And it's always good to have feedback, even if you don't always like the results. It tells you where you need to improve. And I don't see any additional questions, so I'll just turn it to you for any last comments you'd like to share. Uh, just invite uh, anyone that wants any more information. I know I've, I've talked through at a high level the Porsche case study. That information, a, a detailed case study, is available for download at our website as well as a white paper on this topic of customer centricity that, that goes into more detail than I've covered today. And, of course, uh, the, the, the slide deck is available to uh, for, for download for, for all the attendees as well. So. Thanks, everyone, for participating. hope this is a, a topic that uh, resonates with uh, many of you out there. And on behalf of the Institute for Supply Management and Zykus, I would like to thank you, our audience, for your participation in today's event. This does conclude today's program. Thank you, and do enjoy the rest of your day.